Hey, everybody out there. Thank you so much for joining with us today. Uh, I'm going to start with introducing myself. My name is Michael Cody. I'm the producer of a project called uh, Hashtag Enough Plays to End Gun Violence. Uh, and that's how I've been able to gather all of these uh, wonderful individuals uh, with us today. Um, just a brief introduction about the project and what we're talking about and who's going to be talking today. Uh, Hashtag Enough started nine months ago as a platform to give young people, six to 12th grade, to write short plays on the issue of gun violence. Um, our deadline's around the corner on June 20th, and a selection of those plays are going to be used to uh, be a part of this nationwide reading on December 14th later this year, the eighth anniversary of Sandy Hook. And the playwrights that are joining us today uh, have been so gracious in um, um, volunteering their time and their passion to supporting this project and getting young people uh, writing and uh, fueling uh, their writing through their passion and, and a topic that really uh, has impacted them and that they want to write about. So um, today, what we are talking about, we had put this talk into motion a few weeks ago, um, based on an article that Idris Goodwin had writ, uh, written for the uh, American Theater website, talking about the inciting incident, playwriting in a moment of change. Um, how, how can playwriting and theater be an agent for change? Uh, how to get young people involved in that process? Uh, how to uh, get them interested in using their voice uh, as part of their arts activism? So to introduce uh, the, the panelists we have today, um, I won't go through all their accolades. Uh, you can read that on the website because if I do, we will have no time for this discussion. Um, but we have uh, Idris Goodwin, uh, David Henry Wong, Lauren Gunderson, Robert Schenken, and Karen Zacharias. Thank you so much, all of you guys, for getting together today to be a part of this conversation and to share uh, your perspective and your knowledge with us. Uh, wh where I wanted to begin was uh, where the title of this topic really came from. Um, Idris, at the top of the pandemic, you wrote this article for American Theater Magazine, and you wrote in this, you said, this ain't the intermission, it's the show. On this stage, in this world, we, the men and women who are merely players in our various roles, are waking daily in different plays all together. This is the moment where everything changes. We are in the inciting incident. Now you wrote this at the top of the pandemic about our sudden shift out of what we consider to be normal. But in light of the fallout and just the global reckoning that's come out of the death of George Floyd, your words feel more prophetic than ever, really. Um, that what a lot of what we considered was normal really never was to begin with. So I wanted to start by asking you, like, what, what were you grappling with um, when you wrote that article? And now, uh, how do those words resonate back a few weeks um, later? You know, what, what does it mean to be a playwright for you in this moment? Um, well, hi, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's an unfair, very large, very complex question. <laughs> uh, but this is what we're doing. No, nobody said it'd be easy. Um, uh, you know, I, I just, I, I had a feeling that the impact of this, I mean, there's many ways I can answer this question. I mean, basically, I will say that when, when this administration began, I think we all knew, we all had a feeling that the end, like as we got towards the end of this administration, it was not going to be pretty. That there are, there is a certain level of vigilance um, that one must have when they're managing people, when they're in charge of people, when they're responsible for a nation. And you have to kind of be looking ahead, looking very far down the road. And the person that is currently occupying the White House did not prove himself to be that sort of person. So I was very not surprised when something that could have been maybe not avoided with a capital A, but certainly we could we would be in a different situation had that person been more vigilant and reading the signs and basically doing their homework. So I knew that once this started, that it was going to be on us the electorate to manage it, to really deal with it. We were gonna to have to step up. We were gonna to have to 
And that's what, what's happening. It's like we're having to do a lot more research. We're having to find the math. We're having to learn how to teach at home. We're learning how to work at home. We're trying to learn Zoom and what Zoom could do and, oh, breakout groups for Zoom. And, and where that gets us to, because we look into ourselves and was like, how can I be a lot more capable? I got to step it up every day. When something threatens us, when there's something we don't like, we will take, you know, many of us will take to the streets. Many of us will donate. We will support. We will share information. We will, you know, and so that drone shot that's going through downtown LA and you see all those people, you see all those people in front of uh, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. That's Pennsylvania Avenue? Sure. It's Pennsylvania Avenue, one of the, one of the avenues. Six, in front of the White House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now it's you know, Black Lives yeah. Matter Plaza, so that's That's something. what I've heard, allegedly. Yeah. Um, and, so, and so for me, all that to say that, to me, this is, this is the end of Act One, perhaps. Um, uh, and that's, and it, because there's a different version of the pandemic kicking off. There's a, there's a version of the pandemic kicking off you know, that, that, that's very different than this. But of course, you know, because this is a, that you, you cannot avoid race in this country. You know, Karis one says that you can never have justice on, there can never really be justice on stolen land, which means that it, every day we're in this country, we are not having a conversation about race, genocide, all of these isms because, and, and so all the, I knew that all this crisis was gonna do was, was reveal the places where we're vulnerable. And, and so it, it, is a, it, is, it is not, I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I feel like I didn't answer your question, but I got my shots in against 45. Sounds good. That's great. That's great. In terms of like, in terms of moving forward as a playwright, in terms of moving forward as a playwright, and, you know, are, it, do, you find, do you find this to be a moment that is opening yourself up to a lot of writing, or do you find this to be a different, different part of your creative process that you need that you're stepping back and 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 not feeling like you want to engage in your writing at this moment how is how are you responding creatively to everything that's going on i mean honestly yo like this is the stuff i've been writing about so this thing i've been in crisis mm -hmm. i come from enslaved people you know my parents you know my, my grandparents left the south because of jim crow you know, I came up in Detroit, Michigan. I left Detroit, Michigan because of the crack epidemic. You know, I lived in Chicago. I bounced there. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is, I, this is, full, that's it. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a writer in crisis trying to make sense of this crazy train called the United States of America. And um, it's, it's a different vent. You know, I'm, I'm having to get more creative in terms of like what my stage is, but. Mm. The writing is the writing is the writing, you know? How about for the rest of you, um, you know, moving forward from the pandemic to where we are today um, in terms of being sort of thrust into a really um, uncertain world uh, almost all at once. How, how, you know, what does that mean for you to be a playwright in this moment? How have you responded to what Idris is calling, you know, the inciting incident? Um, I'll, I guess I'll go. So, I mean, I also feel like I've been pretty comfortable throughout my career responding to things in kind of real time. Um, and I've been consistently interested in engaging stories that have um, a, a political dimension and that have something to do with the the environment we live in socially and politically. Um, and so I'm very interested in trying to figure out how to characterize this moment, but in a way like to pull back from it at the same time, to try to understand it as um, a moment in history. And what is that going to mean um, because we, are, I mean, we're always living in some sort of a historical moment, but I think that um, it has been a particularly acute historical moment. Um, I would say since 2016, in per, uh, especially, um, and echoing what Idris said, knowing that we're 
in a kind of democratic crisis. Um, and then these two pandemics, uh, the pandemic of COVID and the pandemic of racism uh, suddenly get thrust into uh, the into the foreground. And so this is, for me, a really exciting moment. It's hard and it's heartbreaking and it's terrible and it requires a lot of courage, but it is potentially um, an inciting incident, also a transitional time. And there's a part of me as an artist that wants to already start to look back on this and try to understand of what, um, how is the country changing? How are we changing? Um, is this a, a critical moment in uh, the progress? And hopefully the, um, the uh, reparations uh, that this country needs to um, perform to, in order to have a future. Just to explain the popping in head, this is Simone Emmett. She's a uh, program associate on uh, Enough. And when Hi. we get to the end of this discussion, hopefully uh, we'll be able to field some questions and answers from sure, yeah. folks walking, watching. Yeah, I have some questions from, from folks um, on our Instagram um, who wanted to chime in too. And sorry, I was having issues with the video. So I was just a black screen earlier, but now I'm back. So hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks, Simone. <laughs> Karen, how about you? What, what, what has your, been your response in terms of you know, since the onset of um, the pandemic to now, what, what has it been like for you as an artist? Um, it's been interesting in the sense of, of in a, uh, it's made me try to go uh, look at history in a different way. Like I, I, my children and I are, and my husband, we always say, oh my God, history is in the making right now. We're in the historical moment. But the truth is every day is a historical moment. It's something gets passed and moved on. But this, the pandemic, everyone's slowing down, having time to focus um, and having some of the systemic problems that have been there for a very long time kind of bubble, you know, bubble to the surface in a way that everyone can now see has been uh, fascinating. I had just written a play about a child separation that was done at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh, called The Copper Children, but it was set in 1905. Because the truth is, uh, there, there's these patterns of behavior and, and, uh, and waves of, of things that happen. And so I've been really interested in, in finding and exploring that because um, it's helping me make sense of this moment right now. And I've also started writing uh, vignettes about my family history in order to examine some of the, the behaviors and thoughts and things that have happened over a hundred, you know, 150 years of a family of things and legends that you're told or things. And I've been examining that in order to kind of grow and, and think. Uh, it's really interesting that children or babies are born with only two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Um, everything else is a learned fear. Huh. And so I've been interested in the, the politics of fear, um, examining my own fears and when, you know, and also the idea of what it means to be brave. I think, I think since, I think a lot of people are making the decision to be brave, to change things, to come over that. And I think in a weird sense, the pandemic has made it so that none of us really have our normal jobs anymore. We have more time to suddenly sit and, and sit with the injustice that is happening around us. Um, and to us and for people and all of that. So it's been a real time of, of, of philosophical uh, thought for me and research and examining, um, you know, the other point of the inciting incident is the moment when characters make choices, right? Who are you? What's your character? And what choices are you going to make? And I think that's a big part of what's going on in, you know, the Republic. And I think in everyone's personal life where where, where is the change that you want to make? What are you going to do about it? Lauren, how about you? I mean, practically every single project that I've been working on since after the initial freeze of what the hell is this, <laughs> what the hell is going on and not being able to write 
after a week or so of that kind of feeling of wrapping my head around this new world, plus raising children in, <laughs> in a pandemic, plus my husband is a virologist in a pandemic. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, but after, after I kind of found my, my voice in that spirit again, every project has been in collaboration. So that, that has been a, a singular change for me written a new play with my colleague Reggie D. White, my colleague Margot Melkonon are working on one of our third Pemberley plays we have. Um, but then everything is either, there's a, a project with Aurora Theater here in the Bay Area where there's three writers. And it is, um, plus these classes that um, I've been offering on Facebook and bringing as Karen and, uh, and Idris have been a part of this, just bringing, just talking, tons of talking. And I, I think something about this moment where, we, as Karen said, we don't have our jobs. As Idris noted, like this is, there's a lot of stuff that is being exposed now that has been there this whole time. It's a lot to talk about. And there's a lot of this weird Zoom face-to-face -face thing. It feels like we're having a lot of face-to-face -face conversations, <laughs> which in some way we kind of are, even though it's not face-to-face, -face, but it is. But we're all looking at each other and we're, we're seeing, um, seeing each other react in real time. Um, and I, so I will say collaboration is a big deal. Um, part of why I love this project that, that you've created is this chance to have all of these young writers out there be a part of that collaboration, be a part of this, this reckoning, this writing, this creative space, this strange intimacy we have with Zoom, like we're in each other's homes, all of us are in each other's homes. Uh, are, maybe we're knowing each other better than when we met at the coffee shop to have these conversations mm -hmm. and it's a blank space. So. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm reckoning with all of that. Um, and then of course, the, 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 new, the new moment, again, long coming um, of a conversation and this, this um, unflinching reality that certainly white America is, is coming to find new language. And for language people, I think it's critically important for us to use what we're good at, which is words, to say like, let's find the best and biggest and proudest and um, most profound words um, to describe this moment, to admit the things we need to admit, to talk about the things we need to talk about, and to say, you know, white supremacy is a very important word to be able to use confidently and understand what it means. But also, I love you is the same profound thing. And to be able to, to, um, to examine what those words mean in real time. Um, and I think part of what made me uh, dig into this metaphor that Idris brought with this inciting incident is the inciting incident that midpoint and our climax will differ depending on who the play's about. So for me, as, as a white woman raising two half white, half Jewish boys, um, my midpoint where things change so much that they can't go back to the way we were in act one, it might be different. Um, certainly, certainly is different um, to my colleagues who are Black Indigenous people of color. So I, I think honoring that is an important thing too. Um, and I think that's part of why I've been reaching out for collaborations so much so that there is duality or um, that there's not just one voice. So. I, um, I think the thing I feel uh, most keenly is the sense of responsibility as an artist citizen to be uh, active alive uh, and listening in, in this moment. What I'm trying to pay attention to very, very closely are the stories that are being told, the stories that are being constructed or deconstructed, being offered, um, and the language that is being used, the words as, uh, as Lawrence referenced, um, the potency of storytelling is of course what all of us deal in. And um, in the civic political sphere, it is critical. And I think that's why writers and particularly playwrights have such a uh, responsibility and, and an ability to be useful in this moment. And that's, that's the thing I want to be, is to be useful. And um, a good part of that for me right now is uh, quite honestly shutting up and listening. I do a lot of that. So. You know, Lauren, one of the, one of the things that you, you've talked about in some of your videos on Facebook and in some of the things that we've done with Hashtag Enough is that you, you approach plays sort of as, as thought experiments. And you talk about 
um, that plays are these chances to um, imagine what the future is going to be and keep asking the question like, what if? What if, what if we were able to look at the world this way, right? Um, and it reminded me like recently in the Tribune, there was an article about um, uh, kind of along this lines, like uh, if, if Hollywood were to take this moment of pause and to look at like cop shows that are stuck in this cycle of reinforcing the status quo, you know, what if networks and streaming services, services thought bigger? What if they greenlit fictional shows from an activist point of view and showed what the benefits and challenges of some of the things that are being talked about in the public sphere um, would be, uh, what, what it would mean to defund the police and what, what a show about that, what a story about that might look like. So, you know, what about the theater? You know, we're, we're in this moment where regional theater and Broadway are on pause indefinitely. Um, and is this a chance for everyone to step back and think about what they would do differently by painting different visions of something new? I mean, how can playwrights and theater use this moment to ask valuable what if questions? And to you guys, what might those what if questions be? Well, the timing is very, your question is, is uh, right on time because a, a major um, document went out yesterday. Um, I think it was called Dear, Dear White American Theater, something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was signed by, you know, a significant number of, of uh, theater artists, some of them whom are on this call with you right now. Um, and, and folk are doing just that. Folk are, folk are using this moment of uh, where things are forced to slow down, which, which in a lot of ways was the reason that, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that like, yes, like some, there's a lot of people who just have an agenda and it doesn't include, you know, certain individuals in that. I think some people were just victims of the machinery and fear of turning off the machinery, right? And so now that you're forced, there is, you know, everybody has been humbled a bit, right? You know, you came out, you came out swinging your first three rounds and George Foreman was beating that ass. You're like, okay, maybe I got to switch my game up. Maybe, maybe, maybe I do that rope and dope that I've been thinking about. You know what I mean? Maybe I got to just like take this punishment and, and just pace myself. Um, so that, that is what's happening. I think people are like, I, I know I, I have this conversation with myself all the time. I can tell you right now that there are things I do not want to go back to. I also think that there is no back to. So, but I can tell you right now, there are certain things that I'm like, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, just not, not, because I've just fell into the machinery. Mm -hmm. I'm like Lucy on the conveyor belt, like stuffing all the chocolates everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, that's how old show my age a little bit. Rerun baby. <laughs> Anyway, let's let some smarter people get in there. I'm just talking. Yeah, David and Karen, both of you signed that the document, the, the one that Idris is mentioning. So, you know, let me uh, toss the question to either of you. You know, we, we're in this moment where we can, where we're maybe out, stopping the machinery long enough to really investigate these what if questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the, the what that was for people who are watching that may not I'm not sure what theater person doesn't know about this document at this point, um, but if you want to talk a little bit about that um, and, and, and other things that you, you hope we start asking or posing the question, what if about moving forward? <laughs> I think, I think okay. David's passing the ball to you, Karen. I'm, 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 okay. I'm, I'm, I'm uh. Well, the, the document is just a, uh, it's, it's a, it's just a moment of witnessing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a moment of, of gathering um, a lot of theater artists. I mean, inequity ex exists in all lines of work, but it, it kind of, in a sense, and supposedly these liberal bastions that is a theater and, uh, you know, uh, selling tickets to people who probably all vote, as most of them vote a certain way. Um, there's some there's some real room and necessity for self-examination. And the, the things that I'll, I'm sure David and Idris and I could spend a lot of time, those things that are said to us in, uh, in passing many times that completely 
<laughs> that can completely un unmoor you in a sense as a writer uh, about who wants to see your work or why you can't your work can't exist in this space or why certain ideas are too scary or um, and so I think it's it's a it's a moment. I mean, I I still it's you know the Black Lives Matters movement is the precedent here, but it's also it's also supporting all our, our our black artists and also saying white America is not just we all have an eye. We all have to see what's happening um, in a sense. And there's, I mean, Idris brought up the word fear, fear, fear. Fear is what makes people want to get, buy guns and, you know, uh, people saying Antifa is coming to certain places. And that, it's, it's crazy, this manifestation of fear in order to stop change. And the truth is, if one thing that's always fascinated me since I was a kid is like, why do we build up social constructs that really hurt everybody? Like in the long run, it sucks. <laughs> it, there's certain people that have more advantages of it, but in the long run, it really, really hurts everybody. And everybody's like, oh, but government has to work like this, or this has to be like this. And I understand there's certain people who have power and they keep it. But it really, really, at the, at the end of the day, it dehumanizes everybody. Um, and you know, theater, people, and this is what Robert was saying, uh, we need new stories to understand new points of view. And I cannot tell you how many times people have, because they've seen a, a brown or black character on stage, have then said, oh, well, then I decided to say hello. I saw my, you know, coworker in a different light. And I was like, really? You have a live person in the bathroom next to you, and you don't think of them as a person, but you saw a story on stage that made you rethink that? It's it happened to me more than once. So uh, uh, the, the theater has a responsibility. Um, and we're holding the people who have the power accountable. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the statement for, because maybe there are people um, who are watching this who aren't aware of it, just um, is you can find it at we see you, like, you know, just spell that out, those three words out, we see you, W A T, White American Theater, we see you, W A T dot com. And you know, it's, it's uh, really, I think, an initial uh, statement, a, a, a one step forward to say, okay, these are things that we have seen and we haven't talked about them or we haven't been honest about them or we've been code switching to be safe or to um, fit in um, to, you know, basically a, a, a white theatrical power structure. And if you look at the statistics, um, even, you know, there's an organization, APAC, that has been compiling, um, say, casting statistics over the past 12 years. And at least in, um, uh, on Broadway and the, I think it's the 12 major not-for-profits in New York, um, casting has been, you know, an average of 75 to 80% white. Um, it's better now. I think it's the most recent report, which was maybe the Hamilton year, was 66%. But, you know, you look at those numbers, and I think people are surprised because people want to think that we're doing better than that. And then I think like 89% of the plays were written by uh, white authors, you know, that sort of thing. So if you look at the statistics, the theater is not doing as well uh, by far as we would like it to. So I think this initial letter is a statement about that. Um, and then, and that's important. And the next step is to begin to um, think about actual concrete proposals, mm -hmm. like to the extent that you really do care about this and it's not just in your mission statement, but you want to um, address the sort of structural um, racism that exists in the theater, what do we, be, what do we be, begin to do about that? You know, what kind of programs can we devise? And um, s some of us are fortunate enough to be, you know, have some positions of some influence. Um, and, you know, we have to examine ourselves as well um, for that. And um, so it's potentially, again, a, a great transitional moment when 
because everything got disrupted, we can begin to say, um, we don't want to go back to normal. We can rethink some of these uh, paradigms, some of uh, what we assumed uh, was always going to have to happen. I think it's also, this is why what's so exciting about this project is I think I, I, I think it's critical to get more young people engaged in, in what this is because, and I say this a lot, the, the, the industry, it is the industry, it is the money making mechanism of theater as we, as, as interpreted by some that is threatened. Like theater as an art form, theater as a human need, theater as the scene place, fine, it's gonna live forever. It's like the roaches will be doing theater. Like there is no, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's fine. So let's let's talk about what we're really talking about. We're talking about like, y'all can't make no more money right now, you know? Um, and so for me, I'm excited about the part two of the indictment, which is, here, here's, here's how we need to rebuild this thing. Here's how we want to be positioned and integral and centered in the reopening, in the rebuilding. We are in, in a remixing moment as far as I'm concerned. Like the future is the remix, the art of the remix. Somebody needs to get Diddy on the phone and we got to talk about the remix because that's what it is. It's like, how do we just take what was hot and just leave all the rest on the cutting room floor and then just hotten it up and just make it more funky and just look more like what this country really looks like and sounds like. And I think young people's voices especially should be key in that. And that should not be relegated to the subgenres of like youth theater or like educational outreach. Like, no, they're in this world too. They have a voice too. We definitely need to be listening to our young people because of all the crap that they're inheriting. So, you know, and, and to me, the irony of the beautiful spirit of this whole thing is to me like one of the ways you combat gun violence is you change the culture. And mm -hmm. if you're involving, engaging young people and, find, and, and, and helping them find other ways to resolve conflict, to express, to look out for one another, to empathize, art being one of those tools, that's, that's, that's one of the ways, you know what I mean? And all these things are related, you know. Oh, sorry, Robert. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's so much of what I was pondering and thinking about before pandemic, before Mr. Floyd, were things about domestic abuse and domestic violence, violence against women and girls all over the world. Um, I was thinking about poverty and hunger and education. I was thinking about certainly everything related to this administration, but that is draining very quickly. So, um, but all of the things that that comes up and gun violence. And the truth is that all these things are related. Guns are related to anti-black violence and guns are related to police brutality. Guns and mass violence are related to domestic abuse and that is related to education. And so all of these things, what part of what excites me about this project in particular, but this moment in time as well, is we can talk about a lot of things by talking about one thing. We mm -hmm. can find, the, uh, theater can be that door to start engaging your mind and your heart to look at all the other doors that are led to the same room. Um, so I think everyone has a, a part to play in this. And part of the what if that I always play is, when I was a young, younger writer, it was like, well, what if women were the center of, I don't know, all the stories? Let's just see what happens. <laughs> right? So my career has been built on playing that premise out over and over again in the sciences and history and politics and this and that. Um, but somebody else may go, well, what if, what if young black women were the center of every, sing every single story in that theater told? I don't know, write that, what is that like? What if this were the center of the story? So it's, it's less about what if the world looked exactly like this vision I'm gonna paint, and more what if we listened to if somebody else was telling the story, if somebody else was the hero, if somebody else was the protagonist, and we give all of our empathy and time to that person, how would that change us? That's the what if that I think is most exciting and most um, accessible and usable right now to young writers watching this. Change who the story's about or tell your, tell the story that you know to be true that you haven't seen um, on stage. So. I think, um, you know, one of the things that all playwrights do uh, is imagine the other 
And, and I think that's a fundamental ask right now um, in order to move past, as Karen says, the fear um, that has been constructed or Idris the machine um, is to imagine in a feeling way what your fellow citizens are experiencing at a human level. It, it is the opposite of the kind of tribalism um, that's currently being touted. And, and I think it's essential to moving forward, um, as David suggests, into, in, into a new and better place. And I think theater, really that's the heart of what theater does. And I think to engage young people in this empathetic, empathetic art form early on um, can be extraordinary in terms of opening them up and empowering them and having an impact. Um, to, to speak to that, Robert, and what everyone's saying, like how, how then can, you know, thinking a little bit more forward, you know, how, how can theater support the kind of urgency that young people bring? I mean, they, uh, you know, in all of these topics, whether it's gun violence, climate change, equality and justice, they're the ones primarily asking the big what if questions and doing action to get to that, you know, to get to answers on those questions. But it, theater isn't usually the go-to place, nor maybe is the process or the machine of theater um, lend itself to uh, an urgent or, 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 or quick response, right? So what can, you know, what can mainstream theater be doing to find ways to harness this activist energy that, that these young people have, and then to help cultivate their voices as they grow and continue to become artists and activists in the world? Get off their ass. <laughs> Give these people a platform now. You know, this, you, you've got to break the mechanism here, which is all about this onerous, lengthy process of development. Fuck that. You, you know, you've got young people who are excited. They want to say something. Give them a platform. Let them sit it. Let them make mistakes. Let them fall on their face. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that you empower them to speak, and they will learn from that. That's how anybody learns from that. I don't care what age you are. You have to do. You have to fail. So if you ask what could theater do in this moment to be relevant, it would be to make theater happen now, make it happen quickly. It is possible to do that. It doesn't necessarily demand the big institution, the big physical plant, the big expensive grant from the fort. It can be done much more expeditiously and it must be if it is to remain relevant. That's what I think theater should do. I mean, Michael, you said you were bringing it up, it's very hard for theater. It's very hard for American theater. Mm. Uh, to respond quickly because that is, you know, Czechoslovakia, when there's a revolution going on, I mean, playwriting was a big forum. If you look at Latin America, the way that uh, many of our countries, um, indigenous reform, et cetera, were people putting on plays and taking them to plazas and doing that. It's this idea of a large, heavy season, a subscriber base, uh, the, the, the holding together the whole institution versus the inside, the heart, the, whole, the soul and the content is what we're talking about. And so mm -hmm. what I am hoping that, you know, a lot of these, you know, it's hard to turn the Titanic, but there's a lot of nimble, smart theater companies. You know, I started a theater company 25 years ago. All we do is plays written by young people. Um, and there, it's fast, it's nimble, it goes up young playwrights there. There's a number of theaters that address this, but I think the mechanism, and it's a, it's a capitalistic system that says that, oh, we have to do this like this, but you know, subscribers aren't even subscribing anymore because people want something, people are waiting for the time. So I really think this moment where theaters had to pause, where everyone's unemployed, is a moment to say, how can we, how can we do this kind of pop-up um, situation that that how do we fund that how do we give that support but that's about American theater I think and I think it's time to not just say oh we can't change it this is an opportunity to really look at it and say you know it's kind of not been working really well for a long time maybe this is an opportunity to rebuild just like we're talking about rebuilding police you know police policing systems and other things like that this might be a chance to rebuild and redistribute and give chances to voices that have been unheard to make us a stronger and better democracy.
Sorry. There's my revolutionary talk. <laughs> There's no need to apologize for that. That was awesome. And, and, you know, the cumbersomeness of American theater is actually kind of ahistorical, too. I mean, it's, yeah, it's been that way for the, this way for the last 20 or 30 years, but that's not even true. Like, you just go back to, say, the 70s, and, you know, Joe Papp at the public theater just sort of putting stuff up, and a lot of it didn't work, but, as, you know, a lot of it did. Or people starting to find... A, a, they want to say something. So they just find a, a, a storefront and start putting on their shows. Um, that kind of stuff can still, certainly still happen today. Um, and I would say to young people, you know, yes, of course, it's great to get an institution to produce your play. But the most important thing is that you hear your play and that you put it up however you can do it. I, my first play, I put up in the lounge of my dorm, and then it did get to the public theater about a year later. But it was because I just wanted to hear it. I wanted to see it on its feet. And you can reach people that way. Um, and so, and, and that way you do respond to the moment. And especially now that the walls are down, um, make an audio play out of it. Do it on some Zoomy thing or on your Instagram. I mean, a play doesn't necessarily have to be two and a half hours with a 15 minute intermission. It could be 30 seconds. It could be 15 minutes. It could be a two hour, again, on uh, audio theater or something. I think we're all reinventing what theater is now, which whether that lasts, which I hope some version of it does, because I think it makes it incredibly democratic and accessible to a lot of people for which theater has not been. But it also means that you're flexing your muscles, you're writing, you're making a thing, you're reaching out, you're building community. A story kind of doesn't work in, in a vacuum. So let's make it, put it out there. Um, tell us about it. I want to hear it. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll listen to your podcast. <laughs> so, um, I yeah. Think, I think, uh, oh, sorry to cut you off, Lauren. I just got like, I'm in the conversation zone now because just something you said. I, as soon as you said that, I'm like, I really hope that for a long time, theater is just outside. Like, you know what I mean? It's either like in very, very small spaces or like outside and just free for like thousands. You know what I mean? Like, I hope, I hope that's what's in the pipeline. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? It's just a return to big, grand, outdoor, come one, come all to the scene place. And, and let me tell you a tale of two families. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> That, uh, you know, that the doing of that in that way is very much about taking back your power. It, it's very much about the power that um, over the last 25 years, as David suggests, has gotten centrified and calcified in this mechanical system. And it's not until you step back as an artist and begin to look at how complicit you are in that and how much of your power you have given away to other people. And when you begin to demand that back, uh, amazing things can happen. So I think for, for young people who are so thankfully, blessedly gifted with this um, sense of endless boundary, um, you know, this is the moment to encourage uh, the habit of Im in living within your power and not giving that power away, not being so quick to give it away, um, but to express it. I, I, I think that's so critical. And I think that's a, one of the more exciting things uh, about this project that we're all supporting. And you I also give, I, I want to give a shout out to community theater because, you know, for, for a long time, because our theater has gotten so professionalized, we've come to look down on community theater. And, you know, sometimes brilliantly in movies like Waiting for Guffman. But actually, you know, community is at the heart of theater. And if I think about um, when I was getting started and, you know, we, there's a theater called the Asian American Theater Company in San Francisco. And it, it was sort of some professional people and some people who, just kind of wandered in and, you know, it's kind of chaotic. Um, but we ended up starting, a, you know, playing a big role to starting a, a genre. And so um, we, we all are in communities and to write 
from those communities and to write for those communities, I think harnesses some of the inherent power of theater. You know, one of the one of the things that we're trying to do with this project in particular, you know, with hashtag enough is asking you know, young people, teens, six to 12th grade to write about a difficult topic, to write about gun violence and confronting that. And it's just one of those topics that unfortunately, you know, the, the blowback from certain individuals can be, can be harsh and it can be vicious. Like people take real umbrage with the fact that you even want to discuss gun violence uh, as a topic at all. And, um, you know, I'm sure, uh, a handful of you, maybe all of you have had to withstand um, criticism or um, harsh remarks from people about the plays that you've written. So like, what advice can you give young people on this topic or any topic, you know, to stand by their voice in the story they want to tell? You know, just how, how, you know, what kind of advice can you give young people to sort of fortify them to stand by what they believe? Um, okay. <laughs> I mean, I think it's, I think it's part of the, of what we do. We put things out there and yes, it would be great if everybody liked them, but that's not the point. The point is, um, everybody's going to have their own opinion about it. And that's how we engage with an audience. And if you just think about anything that you go to see, if you just, if you go and see a Marvel movie and you and your friends are arguing about it, some, some people are gonna like it, some people aren't. And that's the nature of what it is that we do. So yeah, we've all gotten criticized and we've all mostly get bad reviews and occasionally get good reviews and all that. And that is, um, that's the life we chose. I, I also want, I want to like tell uh, a lot of the young people who might be watching this that it's really fun to be subversive. How do you write a play about guns that doesn't have a gun on stage? How do you write a play about guns that has animals? How do you write a play about violence without, you know, there, there's, so, I, 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 there's so many ways to get around this, uh, to, 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 to get from different points of view. And I really, really hope that people aren't just worried about the criticism, but they actually find a way to really, really plummet what, what does gun violence, what does violence mean? What does it mean if you're in the 1800s? What does it mean today? What does it mean 100 years from now? Um, that uh, to use your imagination, your creativity, uh, well, well it, then the story will really, really feel like yours um, because only you could have thought of this, this angle into it that way. And so when sometimes a subject, subject is given, it actually gives you such freedom to reimagine and play with form and all sorts of other things. I mean, I hope there's a musical. And, and, what, and what is undeniable? What is human about even people you might imagine that would be the, antagon the, the <laughs> antagonist in a play? They're fighting for their family. They're trying to protect themselves. They want the best for their kids. They, they love their grandmother. <laughs> you know, like there's a lot of things we share when it comes to policy, those things get very specified and, and delineated, but there's so much about the lived human condition that is universal. So what, what are those things? Um, so that if somebody comes to see it and they you know, have a second amendment bumper sticker on their car, um, what can they walk away and say, you know, I, I, I you know, love my mom the same way that character loved, loved her mom. I, I reckon I was scared like that when I was a kid as well. Um, and have that be the place that you start building the bridge of, I know this and you know this, we both know these things to be true. Now let's try to imagine our what ifs about what would change in our in policy that would bring us even, even closer to, to the same mindset. So there's so much about the human condition that is common that you can perhaps start that as a way to, as a way to relate to people that and I have to practice that in what I do too, because I am I'm quick to judge people who might have voted for somebody different or think a different thing or use a word with a connotation, you know, but how can we, and, and part of our practice is calling it out and part of it is saying, all right, but who are they really? Who, who are they that we could actually get together over a cup of coffee and, and laugh about some, and laugh about the same thing? What's that? Yeah. I became a playwright at 10 years old when I moved to this country and there was a very mean boy who said some awful things about where I came from 
that I could not think of how to respond to him. And I went home and wrote dialogue. So I was ready for him the next time that I encountered him. And then I started wondering why he was saying these things. And I started building a backstory and I grew such a compassion for this kid that by the next time I met him, I was like, oh, I, I understand you. Let's have a conversation. So um, that was the impetus for starting Young Playwrights Theater. And that's what the impetus of why I'm so excited by Enough is what dialogue would you like to have with anybody in the world? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think what Karen is that the, the notion of you're not writing a play to wave a magic wand and change everybody's opinion. That's, that's just not going to happen. That's what, but what you are trying to do, I think, is create a conversation, um, is to begin to, is to model and practice empathy in a way that might elicit a more human response to the subject at hand as opposed to the fear machine response. Um, you may very well, as, as a young writer, you know, be, be told that this is not your place to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, the question is, well, what is my place? Isn't it to be an active citizen? Isn't that what you want for me? Don't you want me to be engaged in the life uh, of my country? Um, don't you want me to be a good student? And doesn't a good student ask good questions? Isn't that what you want from me? Um, I, I think that um, I have found in moments, uh, uh, tense moments uh, with audience members, that to reflect back to the individual that I'm in conversation, what I have heard them say to me, just as a tactic, as a way of making them feel that they have been heard clearly helps to diffuse the situation and allows us to begin to move a little deeper and more towards an actual conversation as opposed to two defended positions. But I don't think you should ever, ever be afraid to have your opinion. That, that is the point of this. Yeah, and I'll just uh, say, I mean, Church Tabernacle preach seconds on all that round of seconds. Um, uh, there's a reason that the First Amendment is first and the Second Amendment is second. Speech is speech is more important. It's more powerful. We don't, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Mahatma Gandhi, Malcolm X, Nina Simone. The list goes on and on and on. These people are more. Their words are immortal. You know what I mean? Um, so it's like you know, this is, this is who we are. Like our right to have a gun is not who we are. Our, who we are is our thoughts, our ideas, our discourse. And I, I contend that if you're a young person who's drawn to this in any way, you were brought to this for a reason. Like you, you know what I mean? Like you've got something to say and like, don't let anyone else pull you away from that because that's your job. And also just remember people are often wrong, especially adults. You know what I'm saying? We we see that right now. We see that right now. You just look out, you just open anything, you see the 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 bumbling foolishness of the adult world, you know. And so, you know, stick stick to your stick to your you're supposed to do this. And just sometimes people are just wrong. It's just like I mean, when I got started, you know, critics would slap me around all kind of stuff, and I just was like, I disagree. I think I'm the shit. <laughs> didn't mean it didn't hurt. It didn't mean it didn't hurt, but it's just also like I disagree. And you can always tell the people who tell you not to write a play that you can write a play too. Why don't you go write a play? <laughs> then I'll come watch your play. <laughs> I think it also is important to remember that you may not know. In fact, more likely than not, you won't know in the moment the impact you have actually had on someone. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, as a, as a writer, and, and these are real miracles, they're real moments of, of gift when, when you learn from an audience member how something you wrote, a character or a line, really opened their world up or impacted them or changed them. So, but, but that's very rare. But it doesn't mean it isn't happening all the time in what you do, in what you say. 
and and you need to you need to hold on to that truth uh, to your truth and express it as clearly as you can, knowing that even though you may not be privileged to hear that gratitude or that response, it's real, it's there, it is happening, it is happening. And it doesn't happen without you. The word is where it all starts. Um, we, you gathered all of these working playwrights and Michael, we're all sitting here in anticipation for what you are going to write. And your words will employ actors and directors and you know, do a web. I mean, you will start a web of communication that starts with whatever word you're putting on a piece of paper, you, they will get transferred and it has like an exponential growth out, out of that. And so I'm really excited uh, for all the young writers out there to be brave, to write what's in your heart, to write more than one thing. Be, I mean, it, just figure out what, you, what is scary for you and share it with us because we're all sitting here waiting to be your audience. And there's people and actors waiting there to say your words, but we can't do it without you. And I also want to add a special invitation to um, some of you young people who are thinking of writing who may come from communities that uh, or families that are, um, that are very gun owning, that are interested in guns. Um, because the, any type of of character, you know, there's a wide range of um, humanity and types and points of view within any group. And it's easy for someone who's not in that group to kind of believe that everybody in the, the other group is a monolith, when in fact, everybody in the other group is a human being also. Mm. And so I think those of you who come from gun, gun communities probably have something very important to bring to this conversation. Agreed. Yeah, thank you, David. Thank, thank you all, uh, everyone here. Um, I, we, we have really run out, that was a quick hour. We really hit our time. Um, Simone and I will collect the questions that we've received mm -hmm. and we'll try to do our best to see if we can field them out to some of our esteemed panelists here to get, so that they don't, just don't go into the void that we have some yeah. a way of responding to you. Because yeah. that's what this is about. It's about uh, you being able to share your voice and that someone is listening mm -hmm. and um, that you know that it's being heard. So I want to thank Idris and David and Karen and Lauren and Robert and Simone and thank you to uh, HowlRound who's making this platform so necessary in this yeah. time where we're all um, stuck at home and figuring out how to engage with the world. So really appreciate it. If you're thinking about writing a play or if you know a young person who's interested in writing a play, the deadline's right around the corner. It's June 20th, but they're only 10 minute plays. So there's plenty of time to write one. Um, you can find out more information at our website at www.enoughplays.com. Thanks everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.